Yeah. So, um, yeah, we were just kind of doing a little back and forth earlier in the chat and, um, we, we kind of recognize that, uh, last, last time we were able to meet before the time shift there, we already went into chapter one, which was scheduled for tonight. Um, so I was talking with John earlier and we were just saying like, well, do we want to push it back? Do we want to push it to next week to do chapter two to move on? Or do we want to like push it forward? And I, I remember saying to John, I was saying like, yeah, it's not fair to Ryan because dropping that on him last minute to be like, Hey, we're going to cover chapter two tonight. It's just not fair. So, um, really tonight, what we were thinking about doing was, is just, uh, you know, obviously I want to respect everybody's time. You know, if we thought that if there were new people that were joining, I would be here to answer any questions about the previous session or how book clubs would run, or if there's like topics that people want to talk about other than like what we've covered in the book so far, we'd be happy to do that. You know, um, we also put it out there for other people that, you know, I know, I know Ron and, and uh, Ryan have already joined in last session. So, you know, if, if you wanted to skip out on this week and come back next week, that would be good too. So, uh, you know, I feel a little unprepared today. Um, but yeah, we just didn't feel that it was just fair to be like, let's go to chapter two when it was already scheduled for next week and we've already covered chapter one. So um, it's kind of just open-ended right now, right now. So just want to open it up to the group uh, to ask if like there's anything like that we talked about last week that we want to kind of dig into a little bit further. Um, or if we want to start talking about chapter two, we more than can happy to do that, but I don't want to put you on the spot, Ryan. No, I'm not ready to talk about chapter two. So um, I, I just, uh, I'm sorry. I, I did not prepare chapter two this week. So no, I mean, and you, and you weren't required to like, that was the thing. Like, that's what we said. We're just like, uh, Ryan was scheduled for next week. So it wouldn't be fair to expect him to yeah. present this week. So. Um, I guess, like, I don't know if, if there's anything that people want to, like, chat about, about the chapter ones, or, I mean, I would be even happy to go through, like, how to do Git, GitHub, or to pull these materials down, and how to do, like, a pull, or how to do all the pull request stuff, like, we can do whatever, or Matthew, since you're new, if you want to go one-on-one, -on -one, like, if you want me to review, like, what we talked about last week, I'd, I'd be happy to do that, so it's up, it's up to the group, really, I want to respect everybody's time. Yeah, so we're not going to go like actually. So we already you're saying we already went over all of the stuff in um in chapter one, kind of yes last week. You're saying pretty much, yeah. I mean, chapter one was just like introduction, and it was like it was introduction, and like here's what we're going to talk about with like the book structure, and we kind of talked about that, and like what the organization of the book was, and then like some discussion about like different sections. And that was pretty much all chapter one was. And I missed seeing that like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I know, you, I know what you mean. Yeah. I, 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 I'm, uh, yeah, I, I did. I, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I looked through chapter one, but yeah, you're right. Like we kind of already did all this, didn't we? Yeah. We talked about like some of the recommended reading, some of the getting help. And then it's just basically acknowledgements. And so, um, yeah. yeah, that was kind of already built in there. I mean, like, I mean, we could talk a little bit about, you know, um, we could talk a little bit about why R. I guess we didn't really talk too much about that, about why R and, and some of the reasons behind that. Um, but I mean, most of us are kind of in it. So, I mean, I guess maybe we could just have a little chat about it, about like why we choose R mm. and maybe have a little bit of a conversation about why this group has, has chosen to use R a little bit and then kind of you know go from there and see if there's any like parallels with what the book says so like i said i'm, I'm free floating here so if, if, if both of you if some of you somebody wants to jump off and then we jump in next week go you know you're not going to hurt my feelings this is i feel like i dropped the ball on this but um yeah no worries let's just, yeah let's just kind of have a little conversation about this a little bit i guess because that's part of chapter one is why are yeah why 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 do any of you choose to decide to use r in the work that you do well i'll take it um i i was like a lot of i mean my background is in social sciences and psychology and psychiatry and so you know back in the 90s and the late 90s when i first started doing all this stuff it was god 
it was a dark time um i mean like there was spss and mini tab for god's sakes and you know you you did data cleaning in excel which now i think i think back on that and it feels like a very dark time uh, i mean you just think you know don't don't be doing i i still i don't know if you all have this but like i work with people who are still doing data cleaning in like excel and spss and stuff and it's just like i want to smack them and give them a hug and tell them this is wrong um but uh yeah no i think for like a lot of people it was uh it took i mean i waited until 2014 to change over um i'm kind of glad i did that because you know that was like the beginning of the tidyverse i mean really it wasn't called the tidyverse then it was the hadleyverse if you remember uh that was it was just like dplyr and you know a ggplot and lubridate that was like that was the whole thing right um but uh yeah it would be hard to I'm kind of glad that I didn't like learn. I mean, I do base R stuff, but like I really like the tidyverse because I I think to me the number one reason for using R versus well I'm not even going to get into Python or like other types of programming languages because that's a whole other ball of wax. But I think for me, the reason why R as opposed to say like more traditional sort of GUI type things is just you know um for you know speaking to yourself and other people in the future you know what i mean it's like you know what how did you do this what what did you do how did you do this what you know if something is screwed up where is it screwed up and so like one of the things i love most about r it's not the most exciting part about r obviously is i have this script of all of my intentions and all of my actions and um um uh, it's it's checkable and now obviously you know it's not always forward compatible that's you know the biggest issue with all you know open source stuff but so that's that's a whole other ball of wax um but yeah i think for me the best part is just like you know like i have coworkers who are like oh yeah i, I, I qc this I, I quality checked all this data and here it is and here's the data i'm like okay and then I find a mistake and I go, okay, well, this is wrong. What did you do? Oh, I must have missed that. Well, what did, hold on. Well, how did you check it? You know, and they go, well, I just, you know, and, and they're like just going through and like checking data by hand. I don't even know what that means. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even know. I, I don't know if anyone else has this experience, but like people who don't do like checking and like sort of data cleaning and code and stuff like that, like what exactly, are, you know, how do you know that you're not like, I would be up all night just being afraid of like what things I've missed you know so to me like that's the number one reason why are there's a million other reasons but I think it's unsurpassed in terms of now maybe Python is better for that I don't know I'm not even arguing pro or con Python I mean I'm I don't, but for me like I love that the most it's the ability to have written you know intentions and how you executed those intentions that can be wrong or right and can be checked that's my soapbox. <laughs> no, I think, I think like, you know, I was just kind of like, like, as you were talking, I was kind of scanning through this, like this, the section of why are for the first part. And I mean, I think you hit on some, you know, some major points about it, right? Mm -hmm. Like one, it's free and open source, right? It's free and open mm -hmm. source. So Excel, you know, granted you can get access to get a licensing to it. Mm -hmm. It still costs money. But if you want to use a different statistical programming program, like SPSS, SAS, right. Right. Uh, I can't remember the other ones you have to buy a licensing for it so um, but I think also too that you were mentioning that there was just like tools that are out there to help you verify mm -hmm. and there's tools out there to help you kind of like check your data and to make sure that you are one documenting your data two that you're testing your assumptions when you are doing your data analysis and like mm -hmm. I think another another part of that too is is like what happens if you have to change something exactly like, thank you <laughs> like I may, I, we just put a report together that we just got done maybe like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things where it's like, there's like maybe 45 charts, 45 plots in there because somebody wanted yes. to split it up by so many things. And I sit there and I say, you know how much one, how much time is that going to take when you are like, when you're actually just putting those plots together. But mm -hmm. then like the next step being like, what if someone comes and says, yeah, I want to change the font size for all mm -hmm. those plots. Mm -hmm. just blow up your entire workflow it's just yeah, like exactly yes yeah I, this is the one thing i've been saying in like work meetings a lot and i i'm i'm still kind of like an extremist on this because there's a lot of spss and excel users but to me a project is not like the figures and all of the output the project is the code right 
and the code can be read off or modified or shit canned or whatever you know what i'm saying like you know like you know object you know things that come out of the code are not i mean yeah obviously those are those are the things that we care about but how we got them the intentions and the strategies and the execution of how we got them is actually what we're doing as as an analyst right um and that's what people are paying us for now obviously you might say well they're paying for like you know histograms and tables and it's true but they're also paying for how do we get there i think yeah. and and i think a lot of people are just very like i have a lot of colleagues who are just like who cares about that stuff you know as long as it's right who cares well it's like how do you know it's right you don't know right <laughs> I, I get uh, yeah sorry as you can tell i'm like fired up about this because like there's a lot of people who just are very like blase about i'm sure you all work with these people too right that are very like they they think we're all like in a cult. All the the, the Python and R people are just like cultists, and normal people use SPSS and Stata. And mm. I'm I'm not sure if anyone else deals with this, but I deal with this a lot. <laughs> yeah. What about you? What about you, Ron and, and and Matthew? If you want to share, like, what what would be your perspective? Well, I'm coming to this from a Python background. I mean, I've done almost well. It's not quite right. For a big part of my life, I did all my analysis using uh, Mathematica. But that's quite a different type of analysis. I wasn't doing, I was doing more modeling and not statistical analysis per se, I mean, just you know, rudimentary statistical analysis at best. But recently I've gotten more and more into it, having to use and do more statistical analysis. And, and, and Python, which was my tool for that, is, to be honest, not as well suited as R is for this kind of thing. I mean, we've been doing this, uh, Ryan and I are in this Bayes Rule Book Club uh, as well, and I've been trying to work through a lot of those things in the Bayes Rule thing using uh, PyMC, which is Python's kind of their dominant Monte Carlo, Bayesian Monte Carlo Markov chain tool, and it is just nowhere near the polish that our Stan Arm has, for example, it's just nothing yeah. more like it. And so and the other thing that brought me to R really is all this community and uh, the yes. learning tools. I mean, if you want to learn about statistics, 99% of the time you pick up a book on whatever it is, Bayesian analysis, um, in statistical learning, anything except for perhaps, uh, you know, neural network stuff is almost always going to be using R. Yep. And so you just have to know it. I mean, you just have to learn to know it to, to, for that reason, if, if anything else. But as what I'm learning from this book already, uh, this advanced R book is teaching me one other cool thing about R, which I was not aware of. That is, it's very actually, it seems clunk clunky at first when you're using it in, in esoteric in ways if you're used to other languages like C plus plus or Python or anything else. But I'm starting to learn more and more about how it works from this uh, book I read. I had a little bit, and uh, I, I like the fact it's kind of a functional language and has some kind of cool features to it. Yep. So those are kind of my my take. It's you know, kind of scattered, but <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I like it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you bring up a good point about that. You know, it says it right in the book in chapter one with the deep seated language support for data analysis, right? And so you know, not only does it have like the the different packages to do the different analyses, it has the documentation to do it, but just generally like the data structures that are available with an R play towards the strengths of those data analyses as well. And yeah. So well, think about it. It seems like to me a lot of people out there doing machine, uh, instant, should say statistical learning or statistics or anything like that, if they're not using one of these other things that Ryan was talking about, they're probably using R. And a lot of the professors are using R. That means that these packages are getting hammered hard and getting really polished, whereas the Python stuff is not too bad, the stats models and all that, but I don't think they're getting hammered as hard. And I keep finding all kinds of issues when I'm using them. Like with PyMC, I, I find all kinds of issues. Like, well, that doesn't seem quite right, or you can't do this very easily or whatever. Um, so I, I think it's just not, I mean, there's a big community out there using PyMC, don't get me wrong, but it seems like it pales in comparison to the R community, um, as far as I can tell anyway. Now that's the opposite is kind of the case when it comes to neural networks and deep learning and all that that's dominated right now for sure by python but yeah i bet you are alive it up if, yeah maybe our yeah. won't catch up because i don't know how really useful deep learning actually is for everything people yeah you know, people want to use it for everything but it seems like somewhat limited i think a lot of it is oh, like it's, it's it's not about even the capabilities a lot of it is about um 
just like what community you're in. So if it's like more of like a straight business community yeah, yeah. Or, or like, you know, or data engineering community or whatever, like, you know, like doing like hardcore, like computational stuff, it's more likely to be Python. And then if it's like more academic or more sort of purely research focused, in my experience anyway, it is more likely to be an R user and there's an R solution to that problem, right? And so, yeah, that would be like a number, another thing, like I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of like, as, as I've been ranting about like, quality checking data right and so yeah. i have you know i have colleagues who, who do all their checking like visually and they like they like have these checklists which are meaningless to me completely meaningless um so i'm like okay like the careless package which i don't know if you guys are familiar with this but it's a it's a it's basically a package for checking careless responders i don't know if anyone hmm. else does this, but like if you use surveys like there's people that like they speed through it or they just pick the same response so we need to like create these like in, in th these indices That's of me how random how random people are or how how poor they're you know responding is and so um yeah like i literally have like co colleagues who are like oh i'm trying to work on like a macro in, X in excel to do this i'm like stop just stop yeah. um <laughs> you know but anyway as you can tell i'm I'm a little i'm a little fired up about this um but it's, it's <laughs> yeah sorry go ahead but anyway, that's that's uh, yeah. So I the, the packages. You're right. It's like, which you know, it's 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 true. Like there's a lot of community support for it, and so if there's problems, you hear about it pretty quickly. Usually, I I would think, but I, uh, you know, it's th things get fixed. Yeah, you should share that package. The other one that like if you're doing like data validation stuff, like oh, point, point blank, pa point, point blank, blank, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, actually, the R user group in Cleveland, which is where I live. Um, they just we just had a speaker talk about that and i yeah actually i've um yeah i don't know like i i, I work with relatively small data sets that are kind of like pulled from a, a server you know and like aggregated from multiple sources and they're really really small but i think a lot of that point blank stuff is um if you have like continuous data coming in you know some pipeline if you're like dealing with like clients or i don't know whatever and so you want to be doing that in real time i don't know anyway yeah, that's awesome. That's, that's yeah. an excellent point. So I think another thing I was brought up to, and I'm just curious for all the people that are here, because it's just interesting to hear, is that one of the points about why R is this idea of like powerful tools for communicating your results. Yeah. And so I was wondering if like, what types of what types of things do you use from the R like ecosystem to like share your results that you've found beneficial? Mm. Ron, what do you think? He's not, he's not used, he's use, not, he, I mean, yeah, 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 he doesn't use R. Yeah, so. I don't really use any of that. I'm just still basically using Python, uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I Now, that being said, I have been using Quarto and RM, uh, R Markdown in these book clubs. <laughs> so I've been learning yeah, them that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. But I haven't, but other, other than here, I haven't used them. I do I like have, the, the way yeah. Quarto works. I, I want to learn Shiny, too. That looks really promising. I, told, I know there's actually I, that's actually like my next book club thing someday it's like I, yeah there's shiny is such a hot deal like there's so many like people are asking can we do can we make a, a dashboard about this or that and i'm like no i've never really done it but no i use quarto i use mark yeah. yeah yeah i like our markdown a lot i'm learning quarto but our markdown is just such a nice breath of fresh air compared to the Jupyter Notebook, which is only because of the source control. Version control with Jupyter Notebooks is a nightmare, right? Just, it's like, a, <laughs> do a diff, you're like, I don't I know there's tools you can fix that up with, but- I would, I would not, I would- step of installing something. I would not bother with our markdown only because it seems like it's gonna be slowly, um, no, you're but, right, but I, I have some things in progress that are using our markdown already. I'm like, yeah, just finish it, but yeah. Yeah, but um, I think a lot of the stuff, I mean, I could be wrong, but a lot of stuff in markdown goes, our markdown goes into Quarto. I mean, I think a lot of that stuff works. Yeah, I'm not quite easy. sure, but transparent. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's pretty yeah. transparent. My, 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 and again, this goes with my, like, my sort of militant attitude is like, I, my whole thing is like using markdown and using, I also like to create, as you, you pointed out, uh, Colin, about like, you know, 45, like I like to create uh, open X, X, L, S, X as a package, because you can create multiple sheets. And so like, I like, I, I get multiple sheets going and I'll have like tables and then figures in another sheet. And like a lot of people that I work with, a lot of clients and a lot of coworkers and like stakeholders love that, you know? And so like that, to, you know, my, my goal is never to touch the data, like, you know, myself, it's always like, it's gotta be outputted in code or in, in whatever, whether it's a figure, whether it's a number or whatever table, 
yeah and so it's like and th th this is where you know because i have a lot of coworkers who love to do some of this because they only know how to do some of this stuff and then they're like copying and pasting it into like sheets in excel and it's like okay yeah, yeah maybe that works you know but i don't know it's just like go the extra mile and be really sure that if there's something wrong it's in your code because then you can fix that and you can go oh this is where i screwed up you know i forgot to do this instead of that right that's to me is yeah i don't know i mean i mean at the end of the day does it really make make that much of a difference probably not because you know it's, it's, you know mistakes don't you know probably happen that often but it's like they only they don't have to happen that often for them to be an issue you know what i mean and so yeah yeah, I found I found the interface with like, well, you 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 work in a different industry, so healthcare. I'm sure you can't just like put it on Google Sheets or something. But I work in an industry where you know it, we don't have like uh, data that's completely like locked down. We have to have it in a certain environment. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but connecting it with Google Sheets and stuff just you know helps communicating quite a bit. Oh, yeah. uh, the shiny route we've gone down the shiny route. Um, I've done a book club of mastering shiny. Uh, it's, it's a great tool. Uh, it's a great tool up until once you start getting into the point where it gets to where you're creating like really complex apps, because once you start creating more complex apps, then you have to start using like other tools and other programming, like organization and stuff to like, cause it gets to a point where it gets like really, really complicated. And how do you manage that? How do you manage mm -hmm. that system? And, and so I, I like shiny. I think it's great. I think it's, yeah. it's, it's a great tool to use. It's just that when you start getting into like more complex apps, you want, you start asking, does your app need to be that complex? But then you also need to start using these other frameworks to help you organize your code and everything together. So, yeah. But. Yeah. How you organize your code and how you organize your product projects. Like that's a, that's a whole like very like personal thing. Like you have to really, it has to make sense to you because I don't know if you've seen a lot of these like project packages, like, you know, how to make a project. There's a bunch of them, you know, like actually, yeah. I mean, so but and, it, and and some of them make no sense to me because I'm not trying to do the things that they're trying to do, you know. And so, um, yeah. But I totally agree that like, yeah, you gotta have it set up like in a way that makes makes the most sense to you and to you know to the future you, right? That's and or or whomever. Like you hit you get hit by a bus and now all of a sudden it's like how are they gonna piece together? Like I I my my last job I spent a lot of time like you know fin finishing all my projects and like you know notating and like commenting and doing all this, this stuff so that someone else can do this and this guy that took over my role he's like man thank you so much you know and like to me like that's that's the goal you know not to say that like you know i'm patting myself on the back because i could have done a better job on some of that stuff you know but like you, we've all been through there where it's like okay somebody left their folder of their project and it's just holy chaos you know there's like 32 data files called final file you know with a with a with you know numbers after it and it's like how do you know what's what the final data is how do you know what the final code is how do you know what the final hmm. yeah anyway yeah so that's great um so i'm just kind of picking on some of these other points here um so the other one that talks about and and i'm interested in ron's perspective because you're coming at it from a computer science uh area um because you're working in python and maybe some c and c plus plus if i heard you say but like um like the ease of being able to like if r is not enough if it's not fast enough or it doesn't meet your functionality to like you know to do that you can build on it right you can add to it but in addition to that you can use other programming languages on the back end to make it faster and so I just like, I think that's kind of interesting to kind of talk about because I guess uh, maybe I'm just like talking, but like, you know, someone once told me that they're like, well, someone said like their argument was like, well, my argument against R is, is that, you know, some of the functions that you're using are built in C++ and you can't modify C++ code. And I said, well, that's true, but the same thing happens in other programming languages as well. Like if speed is of concern, you're going to have to use another tool. So I don't know. I, mean, I just some, want to kind of get... some of these numerical libraries that are being used by in Python, for example. I know for sure. Maybe some of the R ones too are actually still using old Fortran code for crying out loud. So you can't use that as an excuse. And hey, C plus plus isn't that bad if you don't, you know, you don't have to worry about the uh, some of the more esoteric things, especially if you're just doing like taking a piece of code and, and speeding it up. Uh, that level of C++ writing is not that difficult, it turns out, really. Unless you've never done 
a language like C with you have to worry about types and everything, but I don't think it's too difficult. Yeah, that's of course, I mean, you know, if you really care about speed and you like these kind of languages, Julia is another language to look at. I do plan to look at that someday. Uh, that's supposed to be wicked fast because it compiles everything, although it acts like a scripting language, which is kind of nice. But again, I wouldn't use it for any production stuff because it's still kind of coming online and the libraries are there, but they're not like as polished. So, mm -hmm. so cool. So we kind of hop, think, we kind of hit. Oh, go ahead. Really, sorry, go ahead. Think, sorry, I just want to have one more comment. On that. I also don't think this is something you really need to worry about because, like, when was the last time? Like, oh, this stupid thing is not running very fast, and it turns out, oh, you know what? I just need to vectorize this a little, and then you know, take advantage of the underlying code better, and it runs really fast after all. So. Um, it's pretty unusual. I know that when I was doing analysis in Mathematica, Mathematica is also interpreted language. I had to write quite a bit of uh, C++ to speed things up, but I was doing some hardcore, you know, uh, physics calculations. So it's a little bit different. And heck, nowadays, uh, Mathematica has a built-in compiler. You can just write Mathematica code with no compiler. I wonder why, is there, if there's something like that for R yet, like just automatically translates your R code into C code or something like that. Uh, that is that is a, a great question. I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know. That's way beyond. That's way beyond my skill set. I mean, like at, at the same time, you know, someone brought up that argument to me one time. They're like, "Oh, you use R." I, and then they went down the argument. I don't use R because you know some of the functions are built in C plus plus. And I and I remember sitting there saying, like, the stuff that I do, like if I am touching C plus plus code, I've done something really wrong. You know, <laughs> yeah, like probably. I'm not. I'm not well, doing anything crazy. What were these people using though? I don't understand. Like, were they using it so much better? I think they were. They were. They were talking about Julia, and they were talking oh. about. They were trying to use Julia. They were trying to use Python, which you know, I'm. I'm not trying to do flame wars because you know, I've. I've started to learn Python, mm -hmm. and there's some aspects of that language that I absolutely love. And so, but this yeah. person was just like, they were trying to make, they, I think they were trying to knock R down to say like, oh, well, if you want to extend it, and you or speed is a concern you know, you have to know C++ code. And I was like, mm, if I have to do that, then I've done something completely wrong. But I, I can't remember. No, you're going to say, I've never had to do that. <laughs> so we're good. <laughs> I think we're going to learn something. We're going to Julie, okay? <laughs> we're going to learn something about that, aren't we? Like, um, like yeah, isn't our RC, RCPP is like, that's that's the, that's the C++. I, I, I know very little of this, but I've heard of. Yeah, I mean, such things again like you were saying it's something you probably will never need to use and if you you know you shouldn't be re reaching for it very often let's put it that way yeah, yeah. chapter yeah. 25 is all about that so yeah chapter 25 so, yeah it's like some loop inner loops you rewrite the inner loops you're good yeah so i guess some of the like so i'm moving on to like the biggest challenges and some of the opportunities that were brought up so um you know one of the topics, the first topic of it was like much of the R code you'll see in the wild is written in haste to solve a pressing problem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What do what do you think? What are your thoughts on that as a, as a group? I mean, that's certainly true of Python code too. Actually, it's true of almost any analyst code, right? I mean, you're like, I want to know what the answer. I think got to get this figured out. And then you do figure it out. And ideally, I'll come back later and clean this up. And you probably never do. I'll tell you one thing though that R has going for it, what Ryan was saying is you make these documents, these executable documents with court door or whatever, it does force you to some, often go back. You're gonna give this to somebody else. You're like, I'm gonna clean this up. I will go back and clean it up. So maybe that's an advantage for R to like not be in haste. But I I do find that my own code, some, some days I'm like, oh, I learned this thing to do this a much better way I didn't know about, but I'm not gonna go back and like fix all my old code. Now it's like, I'm, I'm embarrassed by that old code to use this long, complicated way to do something. It turns out there's an easy way to do it, but oh well. Right. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of that. So if you look out on the, on the wild world of R code, you're going to find stuff like that. You just, I think they just have to be a little cautious. Say, well, this is the way this guy did it. That doesn't mean it's the best way. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting. I'm actually dealing with this now because in the past, like I, um, I got a little bit crazy with the, the using packages and having a lot of dependencies. And every project I have, I created like a series of folders. One has a, has a series of files where like I just list all the libraries that I unload all the libraries. Another one that I don't know if anyone's ever used the conflicted package, but to me, that's like a game changer. 
you know, like every, there's a million packages with like the select function and like, you know, the mutate function and the, you know, God knows what else. And so conflicted allows you to actually like set like, you know, your preferences on like what, you know, you want. So I have a whole conflicted file that where I like resolve all of my conflicts and stuff like that. And so, um, but here's the problem is like stuff that I did back in 2017, I have like the dependencies for packages that yeah. don't exist anymore. Right. And so this is the fun. Right. And so, and there's like, you know, there's like these old um, curmudgeonly people on Twitter who are like, this is why base R is the best because, you know, if you just use base R and you make your own functions, it'll never, you'll never have any dependency issues. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I'll ever be down with that, but um, I do see the wisdom of that more and more as I, as I move forward, because, you know, I mean, like you want to make sure the package that you, it's not even about whether it's, I mean, obviously you assume it's, it's working correctly, but it's like, um, if there's a bunch of like, I don't know if you saw this on Twitter, there, you know, a couple like a month ago, there was like some package that like the tidy versus like dependence on and it, it got like hmm. put on blast by crayon or something like that, that was going to get removed. And if they get removed, like the entire tidy verse was going to fold. And so there was this whole big fear amongst, you know, developers like God, like, I mean, of course it was, you know, it wasn't really a big deal. They ended up fixing it, but it's like, you know, these dependency things are, um, a little scary you know what i mean if you think about it yeah there was some conversation so the last well a couple of things i remember that was i remember that conversation popping up on twitter and some people talking about it mm. but there was also um again I'm, and i'm not trying to start flame wars or nothing like right, that, right, right, but, right 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 you know like i i just use the tools okay and i build my own yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so but like we we had a conversation after the r packages book with jenny bryan and the with Jenny Bryan and she was talking about, you know, there's some movement to think about another centralized package repository outside of CRAN mm. and talking about the management of dependencies and that there's a better way to do that. Mm. I, you know, I'm not capable of articulating the importance of it, but there is conversations about it. And I can't remember, I'd have to go back to that, that video because she shared what another, like a, a, a group of people put together a different like centralized repository to help with mm. that. But it was kind of an interesting conversation. Like, like you're saying, like there's those dependencies that are built yeah. and like <laughs> there might be somebody who's living in Nebraska, just one person who's just, I'm just going to make this small little toy package. And before you know it, it's like the central package to something that a ton of people yeah. use and so yeah yeah no it's it is it's it's weird well if jenny bryan is thinking about it i have high confidence that it's we're, we're getting to some solution because she obviously has a lot of great solutions and ideas about a lot of things but uh yeah i uh well this is another reason for using our end right I, i'm not sure how you pronounce it but it's it used to be called um what was like the there was a bunch of different like kind of you know project level sort of uh, libraries but r r n v you know what i'm talking about r e n v is so basically ron what this does is like you 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 create a pack a project so all of the files in the, in the folder become this project directory and then you 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 click on something to to start r n v and what it does is it freezes what wherever you know all your packages are and so you're only using the library for that exists for that project. So like in five years, if you're using, you know, dplyr, whatever, I don't even know we're on like 1.4 or something. I don't even know what the numbers are. Um, it's always going to be 1.4. But that, the problem is though, is that you're, it doesn't freeze your um, version of R. So it's like, you know, I, I think that's right. Or I don't know if it does or not. Do you know about that, Colin? If like it does, if, it, if it's if like, if it's freezing because that's why you need like docker i think docker is it freezes the entire sort of like system like the way your computer is like you know it's like you know the version of windows or, or mac os or whatever you're doing with the version of r it's like frozen in this like virtual reality yeah yeah so well i mean there's there's a lot of concepts in there that i probably wouldn't know everything about it but i've, I've played around with docker and stuff but it's like it's just a container yeah. to manage the environment that it's running in. And I know there was some conversation about that you should always be doing, like if you're truly doing reproducible analyses, you should be setting up your own Docker container. But like it got to the point where it's like, yeah. if you're going to get into that realm, you're like managing not just like your R environment, which exactly. R is running, but you're yeah. managing like your operating system as well. <laughs> I, know. You know? I know. I haven't got, I mean, I've, I've looked into it and I've fooled around with it, but I'm where you're at, which is, 
like how is this is this is this is, how crazy can we go and still be because it's like yeah then you have to like because the ultimate thing is like to share that with somebody like a virtual environment with like where you've contained all of you know all your dependencies and all of your stuff and all of your and it's like i don't know i can't do that i don't know that i'll ever be able to do that but yeah i don't know don't sell yourself short but i think that gets at the next point here within the book of like you know some of the biggest challenges is that and i guess we're kind of getting at it is it's like you know a lot of people and again i'm using that word very yeah. generally so but yeah. you know a lot of people that come to the from the art community are analysts and statisticians they're not necessarily computer programmers yeah and so there are you know so some of the best engineering practices may not be being used and mm -hmm. so you have to kind of come across some of those inefficiencies and you have yeah. to kind of address some of those inefficiencies that are developed. And I mean, just with all the tools that you have available, I mean, like Docker is just one containerizing tool, like one tool for containers. There's tons of them. And that's just yeah. one aspect of all of it. Right. And so like, I don't know, I think that's just kind of interesting to think about that, you know, once you start getting into this realm of like advanced R, you're shifting your view from being just a straight analyst you know, data scientist into like more of a computer programmer. Yeah. And what no. are some of those things you need to be? So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, um, that is one thing. I mean, to be honest, that is one thing that the SPSSs and the SASs of the world do better than R and Python, which is forward compatibility. You know, you don't have to, you can open up a 20 year old SPSS file and, and I've done that and or, I mean, maybe not 20 years, but at least 15 or 10 and, it, and it'll open and it'll probably most likely work, you know, same thing with word. And, you know, it's like, that's the one thing where they, they get it right, you know? And so it's not, a, it's not a, it's not a panacea over here, but it, you know, it is, uh, I still like the, 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 the pros on this end versus, you know, the other side. So. Hmm. Let's see. So I'm trying to think of, what other points here? Um, we talked about it not being a fast language. Well, I guess that comes into the fact is when if not just extending the language, but like poorly written code, you know, also plays into that speed problem as well. You know, um, that part of this book, and if you've read if you've read ahead, you know, that's going to be what the book is going to be. That's going to be one part of the book is being able to um, talk about writing efficient code, right, and knowing when your code is efficient and how to make more efficient code. And so I think that's going to be a really good thing about this book as well. Yeah. Um, I, I guess the other question too is, is, is anybody doing like object oriented programming right now in R with our group? Has anybody, has anybody approached that subject yet? I guess it depends on what you mean by object oriented. I, I, I'm still like, I don't, I never, I never really understand like what that means, I guess sometimes. I'm going to default to our computer, our computer science uh, um, expert ever. I think, Ron, do you want to take that one? Well, I mean, the idea has always been to, you know, you, you form these abstractions where you com you bind the data with the methods that work on the data. But it's, that's like started way back in the small talk, small talk days. But I think now people, I think object-oriented programs kind of fallen out of favor with most mm -hmm. of the uh, computer science community and most of the programming community really but it is still useful to program with types and that's kind of more what's happening it's more of generic programming with R. from what i can tell from like looking at the little bit that i've learned about like s3 at least and i assume the other ones work that way too it's more generic programming like okay i have a you know, i have a certain type of data type right data frames or whatever you have and then there's different functions will act differently depending on what data type is right this method look up that happens mm. and that's very useful but it's not necessarily object oriented programming or, or nor should it be i mean that's nothing to, I, you know, it was it used to be this big deal like you know people found you know uh people found that you know, for example one of the big hallmarks of object oriented programming was this hierarchy of types where like oh this type is a subtype of that type and this type is a subtype of that type and they'll inherit all these implementation details well people later learn that oh that becomes a nightmare because now to figure out what this class is doing i gotta look at its parent and its parent and its parent and if somebody changes that and then it ripples down to everything else and all this tight you know the, the whole idea was to encapsulate things and they end up creating a big hole in the whole system where things weren't encapsulated that way so 
Now, that's, I, of, I think that's, I, that's less of what I'm doing in programming is and more of like why I don't think it's that big of a deal. But <laughs> yeah. The the way I kind of think about it, and again, I'm not a computer scientist and I know very little, but it's like you have objects, right? You have objects that you have and those objects have attributes mm-hmm. and that object also has behaviors that it can exhibit, right? And I think the behaviors are considered methods, yeah. right? So like what you could do is you could... You, you could have like, say you have an object, your object is a cat. Your cat mm-hmm. can have certain behaviors. Your cat can eat, it can meow, it can move, whatever it may be, right? But it also has certain attributes that are associated with it, right? Is it a black cat? Is it an orange cat? So on and so forth. And so you have that one object and you can use that object and have inside of your system other objects that you're using to model it. And each one of those objects has its own attributes and its own behaviors. Now how that plays into um, like our programming language, that's where I get kind of lost because I don't, you know, I don't see the direct application of it. Sometimes I, I know there are applications for it. Like Ron was saying, well, you, like, I mean, like data frames and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You're using it all the time. Like whenever you do like a print, for example, it's actually a method and it looks up the right method for that particular object you're trying to print and will display it in a certain special way. So it looks nice. Right. Um, so it's definitely a core part of how our works, or at least the club that, um, Dynamic dispatch, I guess you might call it, is it's a core part of how it works. Yeah. And then like and it's like what you said that, about like an attribute, yeah. And like what you're saying was with inheritance, like that was the one thing that always tripped me up with like object oriented programming was like this idea of inheritance. And and your explanation kind of helped confirm what I was reading is like this idea like you can inherit behaviors from other ways to make your code more simple. And so yeah. Well, there's, just there's, because there's two good, things, right? One is to say something is a subtype, right? So, for example, you can say a cat is a subtype of an animal, and it responds to things like feeding that all animals respond to, right? So that feeding becomes a gener- a, a method that you could give to a, you could feed, you could apply to a cat or any other type of animal, right? That's that's good. That's good stuff. That's good. Can we call in in uh, interface? Uh, inheritance is good. The problem is that we were, there was a lot of implementation inheritance where the actual, oh, I'll do the first part of the feeding, then I'll call a super method, it'll do the rest of it somehow, and I make all kinds of assumptions about how that works. Or worse, reach into it and reach into the pieces of the super class part of my object, and you know, it just started getting really messy. <laughs> so nowadays, they recommend not to use implementation inheritance at all. I don't know that um, R, R kind of does, at least S3, the only thing I know about S3, just only, I only know enough of that just because I was curious, is it doesn't have any of that kind of thing going on at all. It's all just kind of, you know, duct typing, you know. If it, if it can, it'll, it'll, if you try to print something, it'll say, oh, does it have a print method? No. Okay, well, then I'll just use the default. But if it does, okay, I'll use whatever you define to be the special print method for that, or the special plot method, or the special fit method, right? I mean, all these things are, I think, done with S3 now, but or were. I guess there's new, one of the confusing things with R is there's not just one object thing, there's S3, R6, S4, R7. So I don't know anything about those, but at least in the book, we'll learn some of those things. R7 right? is still coming Later on chapters. board, I think. Yeah, yeah. R7 is still coming on board, yeah. Yeah, R6 is, well, I know a little bit of R6, but again, it's you have to kind of know those concepts of like object-oriented programming before you can implement the data structure of R6 to do object oriented programming, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of interested in it, but now that you mentioned that, that it's coming out of favor, it might be something that it's probably just another tool that you can use and it, it only needs to be. Well, don't get me wrong, place. grouping, you know, object based, object based programming, I guess you call it, is still very strong and important. It's just the OOP, like back in the, I mean, back in the nineties, man, it was huge, right? 90s and 2000s was huge. There's like big books on UML and object oriented design. Everybody was, everything's object oriented. It was like, it was like uh, deep learning is now, right? It's like everything's object oriented, whatever it is. I don't care. You know, we're throwing that moniker on everything. So, <laughs> so the object oriented book that I have on my reading list needs to get cut out then. <laughs> um, what is it? Uh, it's just like object oriented programming design or something like that i was thinking about reading it but i think i'm just going to cut that out now <laughs> <laughs> i recommend <laughs> um well i guess that kind of goes back to it like it's it also talks a little bit about r being like a functional programming the cool language. thing nowadays is functional i was going to say yes that's, that's the cool kid on the block the functional programming which i love because i was always a big fan of functional programming back you know when i first started learning programming i was using math i was actually using c and then i was using mathematica mathematica is very functional 
So I went on this like kick to like learn everything about every functional language, like what's the best functional language, like Haskell, there's, you know, Scheme, Lisp, all these things. And I still think that's like the best way to approach things. Hmm. Hmm. So if you could, if you could put in like one sentence and maybe it's unfair to put it in one sentence, how would you, how would you describe a functional programming language? Well, a functional program has an emphasis on using functions as a building block, which sounds kind of like, oh, that's like every programming language is procedures, right? But a lot of times functional languages kind of emphasize that aspect of it. For example, they, they eschew generally side effects, right? Try to avoid side effects, pass things by value, right? Try to, um, uh, so that when you call a function on arguments, it always does the same thing. It doesn't do something different just because some background thing, you don't know what's going on, right? Uh, referential transparency, that's called. But so in other words, when you see an expression, it should always just do the same thing. It shouldn't do something different because some global variable set somewhere. I mean, it's that kind of thinking that um, applies. But the other thing that makes functional program, but do you actually see functional programming in practice? I think some of the key things you see are things like mapping and folding, like you're taking a list and then mapping a function over it, um, folding up a list, you know, you know, basically summing, but you can abstract the idea of summing up a list back with an operation called fold, for example. I don't know if that's in R or not. It might be in per. Um, mm -hmm. Might be a per thing, yeah. But um, yeah, so this is kind yeah. of the, the idea, like you're know, passing values into a. You know, think of like uh, your program now has all these little boxes, and, and values are coming into these little boxes and going out the vo boxes rather than, you know, uh, thinking of things as just being sitting in computer memory. Your your uh, in state, you know, like we like call stateful programming. Right? Where it's like, oh, I got this object, you know, got to a program, and I'm going to do something to it, and it changes right there in memory, and I keep changing and, and manipulating mm. it, right? Mm. Yeah. So Matthew, I think you're gonna say something. You probably get a better explanation than my crazy one, but <laughs> yeah, Ron, nah, Ron said something so uh, about functional programming that resonated with something I uh, was working on recently. I was trying to get to get the grabs of uh, the pop, the poor uh, package. So I think that's really where you see the uh, functional program inside of R in a way, because you see how you could uh, apply functions on. Um, on maybe different vectors and you get your results. So uh, I think Paul does the, does the job, but the one question I've been asking myself ever since I went through some videos on Paul is, uh, what then is the difference between the apply family and the Paul package, like the map, the PMAP, the, uh, the different uh, map uh, functions we have, like what then is the difference? Like why do we have to um, um, use um, the map functions? Uh, but that's not what this uh, conversation is on right now, so. Uh, let's just go in. Uh, well, I think we'll, I think we'll, 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 we will get we will get into that though. I think I think we do get into yeah. per later on. Yeah, I mean, just what I've read so far about that, I've only just started scratching the surface on per eh, scratching. You know, they have a cat for their thing, but um, <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, these are just meant to be more tidy versions of those things. And we can definitely do all those things with the base R okay. apply and all the rest of it, but. Yeah, just meant to be tidier, you know. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Well, I mean, I mean, you could even go back further. I mean, per is just per is just a, a uh, is just a set of tools to iterate, right? And if you want to iterate, you could also use for loops and while loops too. So you could you could yeah. achieve the same outcome by using a different like conditional flow, right? And so, I mean, I, I guess we'll probably get into it because I think there's going to be a little bit of conversation about how those different functions, those base R functions and the tidyverse functions, like with the, the functional programming tidyverse functions and how that manipulates with like the objects that you have and how the objects are created and how they're used in the background of R. And so I think that will come up in our conversation for sure. Right, I mean, the um, other thing, when I talk about these things like map and all, they, these, these types of functional things only make sense if, functions can be passed around too. That's the other kind of key thing about functional programs that functions are first class objects. You can, you can pass to other functions and, right. It's, I mean, I hate to belabor the point, but it's kind of interesting that it turns out you can create an entire programming language where the only thing you have is functions and applying them. You can define numbers by like applying things three times. That's the number three here. Right? <laughs> it's something called Lambda calculus. And it's a very like minimalistic uh, programming language in a sense. It's actually mathematical logic thing but um all it, all it has is abstraction you know defining functions and then applying functions that's all it has mm -hmm. i think also everything too, with that 
Yeah, and that's going to be super interesting because, I mean, you know, that's one strength of ours. It's a functional programming language, which is, which yeah. is great. And I think kind of going back, I just want to take a step back about the iteration to, you know, you know, why, why use per over some of the like L apply, the apply functions from base R is, and again, I'm mostly a tidyverse person. I'm sure there's probably ways to apply it within the apply functions, but there's also like convenience functions that go along with the per um, with like some of the convenience functions that go along with it, that definitely kind of help with some of the workflows. Um, like I'm thinking of like possibly and safely, which I kind of like, and then um, just some other convenience functions like walk. Uh, but yeah, there's just some conveniences that I find that per provides beyond just the apply functions, but I don't know apply well enough to say like, there's probably someone that'll be out there. Well, well, Colin, there are ways to do that with be apply and, and everything else. And so. But. Thanks for, for that, uh, Colin. Oh, Ryan's hand up, okay. Yeah, right, Ryan's hand up. I, I came from, um, my background is actually agriculture. I got to know about R in my final year, um, more of a student. So I think this book really applies to me because, you know, most our quotes are like, it said that it says in the book, like written in a hurry uh, just to get the job done and later on, uh, you begin to ask yourself, uh, well, you should have done this better. I could have done this better with more exposure to some other things you can do with R. Uh, I think I had that first time experience when I was working on my first project. Uh, so I was to work on about 50 genotypes of um, sweet potato uh, to characterize them for um, different uh, morphological characteristics. Like, okay, maybe um, the root color, the, uh, which of them has the, um, the highest yield or stuff like that. And, um, it was like after, uh, I think, a year or so, playing with the Tidyverse uh, package, I got to realize that, oh, there's several other things I could actually have done to have um, manipulated my data faster. Yep. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, I was really, really shocked. So when I was working on a, on a fresh data set this time around, I was able to like, okay, uh, I wouldn't go back to Excel because I, I saw then in, in one of the books I was reading then that it's better to clean your data from the... Um, the software you're bringing your data from. For example, if your data is coming from Excel, if you input your data in Excel and you have to uh, move your data from Excel to um, R, it's better you clean your data in Excel than bring it later to R. It's easier that way to clean it there. So normally I clean the data using Excel, but when I found a way to like manipulate my data in R, it became easier and I kind of like enjoyed it better. Uh, although I'm still learning how to get all that done better. And uh, it's, it's been fun, it's been fun. So I quickly had yeah. to do my own introduction because I saw the conversation was going smoothly. So I just wanted to like pause and let everybody just keep going before I interject it. No, I mean, I mean, feel free to interject at any time. I mean, this is this the whole point of this group is is discussion, and and today was a little bit more <laughs> free flow discussion because um, I, because we were supposed to talk about chapter one, which I think we did. I mean, we covered a good chunk of it, other than like. Uh, what we're going to learn, but we already talked about that last week, but it was kind of good to kind of hear everybody's perspective about why they chose to decide to use R and some of the benefits from it, kind of compare that with what the book said, because it's also really nice to know where this group is coming from, too, for what we focus on. Um, you know, it's sounding from what Ryan is coming from, he's coming at it from a very, um, I don't want to say practical, but he's coming from it from like a data cleaning and, you know, kind of data, I don't want to say data engineering, but like data cleaning, data analysis focus. Um, I'm coming at it from that perspective. Sounds like Matthew you might be coming from that. And then we have Ron and, and I don't want to speak for Ron because he's here, but I think Ron, you're coming at it from more to learn some more of the internals of R and how it works and stuff. So, um, but I don't yeah, want to speak right. for you, Ron. To me, it, yeah, you know, you're right. That's basically, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm learning, I'm coming at R from already having experienced a lot of other programming languages. So when I first started learning R, from like books about like R for data science, they just kind of like just oh here's how you do this or how you do it. like well how does that work? I mean like really bothers me. It's like why does that even work? Some of the things seem really mysterious. Like you can pass like the name of a variable in, um, or not even. But you can pass in the name of a column in your data frame with all quotes around. It. Like you have to do in Python. Like how does that work? I mean, <laughs> so I still don't know how that works. Actually, I'm hoping to learn. So. <laughs> oh yeah, the. Um... Oh man, the uh, the program. Oh yeah, so like the un the unquoting and quoting and like programming with like tidyverse functions. 
Yeah, that um, about five years ago, it was a it was a real pain to figure out like what the syntax was to like pass variables and variable names. And then probably just about five, four or five years ago is when they actually oh. like really made that consistent. At least my view of it was because. Oh, well, I guess I'm coming in at a good time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, because it, it used to be, oh my gosh, like, and I mean, like there used to be like different like flavors of doing it. Like they they used to have like different functions to do it. Like these functions called like quo and unquo. And then they had like the double bang bang, which like, just the syntax was all over and then finally like i feel like oh, just wow. within the past four to five years they finally made the, the syntax more consistent to say like here's how you program with tidyverse functions and it makes so much more sense now um i don't know i'm sure we'll talk about it here somewhere but if you're interested yeah so we're going to talk about quasi quotation and evaluation and stuff like that but i honestly think the best explanation of it is like Mastering Shiny has a really good discussion, like a really brief discussion of tidy evaluation. Oh, okay. But then there's also, um, there's two vignettes. There's a vignette in dplyr that talks about it. And then there's a vignette in ggplot that talks about it too. Um, but yeah, that, that was like, that was a struggle a while ago. <laughs> but that was just my view, so. Um, yeah, programming with Deepla. I'll, I'll pop these in the chat for you so you have them. Um, okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, uh, no problem. It's cool for me because I'm just going through the Master in Shiny book. Uh, I'm in a book club for the Master Shiny. So I think that'll be cool. Since I'll be going through uh, the book, I'll be able to check up uh, 12 to see the tidy evaluation. Yeah, the tidy evaluation stuff, it's a lot, it's a lot more consistent than what it used to be for sure. Um, but yeah, I'm sure, but I think what's going to be neat about this book is we're going to get into well, why that is the case, you know, <laughs> like, mm. why is it that we have to do these certain things like syntax wise to make it actually work. And so I think that's going to be really interesting. Mm. Um, so I think we've covered most of the reasons why are, I think we've covered most of the stuff that we're going to discuss throughout the book last week. We're kind of getting up right at the hour mark. Um, does anybody else have any other comments or anything that they want to add to our uh, conversation today? No, it was good. Um, it was a good conversation. I look forward to uh, uh, the rest. Colin, <laughs> Colin, just a quick, a quick question. Um, yeah. Do I have to create a new? Because I recently um, spoke with uh, John. I was uh, mm -hmm. to create my. I was. I'm to facilitate the uh, M Shiny, uh, Mastering Shiny book club. So yep. um, we, could, we walked it walked me through um, creating a token and um, um, having a repo of the uh, Mastering Shiny book for presentation and all. I wanted to just find out if I would have to like um, create a new token to be able to like um, um, get repo for this particular um, book club, or will I see the same token? Like, do you have an idea of how I'm going to get to do that? So in case I see a chapter I fancy and would like to maybe. Uh, presents some sometime soon in the course of this um, book, um, book, uh, book club. Yeah, Advanced absolutely. Do you get yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, basically, you're you're trying to access all of the all the materials through GitHub, right? And you're, I think, if if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're you're trying to set up your token so you can make pushes and pulls and commits to the GitHub repo. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Have you created a GitHub account? Yes, I have. I already um, created a token. I already pulled the, the repo for the Master and Shiny um, book. Yeah, so I want to know if I need to still go through all that process for the Advanced R book too. Uh, you shouldn't. As long as you have okay. a token for GitHub, okay. you should be able to pull any public repo that's out there. And so okay. these are for DS book clubs are public repos. So okay. that token that you use to authenticate should be able to, to let you just get clone that repo down. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So, um, I mean, I can, sh I'm trying to see if I can, sh how, how do you, how do you interface with GitHub? Do you use like GitHub desktop? Do you use the, um, what kind of, what kind of client, I'm going to say client, but if, if you're not familiar with that term, um, how do you, uh, how I, do you actually, how do you do that? I use the R studio directly. Okay. okay. So, uh, I use RStudio directly and, uh, I use the, use this package. And mm -hmm. um, was able to like um, get things running at first. So, mm -hmm. 
So all I did was I, I if I can remember very well, I think what was the procedure again? Sorry, let me just check with you. Uh, okay, so I'm sure there's. I mean, the, I'm because I'm I'm not familiar with use this, um, but. I'm pretty sure there's probably a function in there that you probably use when you pull down your mastering shiny yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, that would, sure. would clone the repo for you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what I'm looking uh, at right now. Uh, it's a. Uh, I'm coming. Uh, it's the. Um, Okay. Yeah, looks like this this one here. Use use this JIT C trip. I think that was what I I I, I did. And okay. after a while I was able to um I did the JIT vaccinate, then I picked in my token, brought it in, then I'm just going through the messages I exchanged with John. So I already I already got that fixed. I just want to know about how I'm going to get one for the advanced R. Or maybe if you just send me the uh uh the the link to the gtub repo for advanced r yeah absolutely um i'm thinking also too that this might help you too this function from okay and again I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective that i don't really use use this i probably should um okay. but um so john might be able to help a little bit better with that to help you because it, it there should be a function in use this that helps you just like clone a repo down like there should be yeah, yeah. and i'm a i i i actually i'm trying to like i, I got the repo already for the master oh, okay. book club now what mm -hmm. i'm trying to access for the advanced hour book club how do i get the repo for that like um can you just share me the repo like the current repo you're using for the advanced hour book club absolutely yeah i'll do that i'll okay. send you the link right now let's see okay. so r for ds book club advanced star and then so here is the link to the um the advanced R book club right here okay um and in fact um did john walk you through creating like a fork like a fork of the repo did he walk you through that process mm. so uh i can do that myself it's just okay. the use this package was a different method entirely i've not used to use this package used this package before mm -hmm. so he kind of explained the way i could go i should go about that so he said if i uh, make any um commit it took uh, okay okay nice 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 um having your round run uh, i look forward to learning more from you next time okay colin so um yeah he, he uh he walked me through um creating the um, book club um M shiny uh repo uh but the only thing i have issues with now is how getting this um the book club for advanced r now i'm currently uh, mm -hmm. on the um, repo am i just to um fuck the repo then mm -hmm. okay maybe I'm kind of confused. Uh, I really don't know how to go about this right now. Maybe, yeah, maybe some other time I'll reach, 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 reach out again then. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I can, I, let's see. So, I guess I can quickly. So, like, I guess, I guess the question is, is, is what, what's the most confusing part? What, what can I help to help clarify? Uh, okay. I, there are two methods I could use to get this done. Two different mm -hmm. methods. Um, I know how to like use the uh, to just copy the uh, <clears throat> the. There's this code that's always on the um, repo. I could just mm -hmm. write the code, then create a fresh um, um, project on R Studio, and mm -hmm. um, I'll have the book um, the repo on my on my system in R Studio. Uh, but mm -hmm. using the use this package, it's like a totally different approach entirely which um john walked me through so mm -hmm. i want to be sure if i needed to create a new token and i've seen that from what you said i don't need to create a new token so um 
I would um, just give this a try and see if it works out. Then if it doesn't, I'll reach out to you on Slack so that we don't have um, John having to go through more than a one hour um, video for this um, course session we have today. Yeah, but absolutely. Once I check it out, I would, oh, I'll, let, I'll, I'll reach out to you. Once I check it out, I'll reach out to you and give you a feedback um, via Slack through a direct message. And um, once I get it done, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, so like uh, the, the thing of the, the hardest part is about with like interfacing with Git and GitHub is there's just so many different flavors of how people like do their workflows with it. And so um, my workflow is a little bit different than the use this package. It's doing the same stuff. It's just, I interact with it a little bit differently, um, but it should, if you follow the use this stuff that John walked you through, it should set you up for what you need to do. Um, okay. But if you do struggle with it, like I'm more than happy to jump on like a separate call to show you how to do it. Um, okay. And I okay. probably, I honestly probably should learn a little bit more of the use this package um, because I, I, for myself, I just mostly do everything in the terminal, but um, I know most people in the community probably do the use this package portion of it. So it's just, there's just so many different flavors to interact with Git and GitHub. And it's like, it's more just kind of working through it. So like trying and see if you can get it to work with what John was having you do. And then if, if it's, okay. then once you kind of figure out like where the sticking points are, I'm happy to, to for you to slack me and then kind of figure like work through those and see if we can solve those issues oh okay i'll, I'll reach out there thank yeah. you so much for your time colin yeah uh, no problem. just the, uh, the time difference yeah yeah it's good it's 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 11 11 p.m mm. so oh, okay <laughs> it's it's quite late already so I, I don't have to go now thank you so much for okay. your time i really do yep, appreciate have, you yep have a good rest of your evening yeah bye thank you bye